so i will be covering the topics you can see here the first of all the estimate uh, 22530 new cases which includes ovarian fallopian tube primary peritoneal second most common gynae cancer after cervical age 63 median age more than 60% of the patient patients with stage 3 and 4 and screening till date no mortality benefit by using ca125 or sonography and uh, so risk factors uh, age family history pcod infertility endometriosis smoking environmental and location protective factors which you know prior pregnancy breastfeeding ocp use tubal ligation the most important point from an oncologist perspective is risk reductive bilateral salpingo oophorectomy i think as a gynecologist you get so many of patients who has breast and ovarian cancer and uh, you should screen for the family to see for the braca mutation and try to convince them for risk reductive salpingo oophorectomy which reduces the risk of ovarian cancer by 75 to 90% in our practice as oncologist we always do breast cancer patient ovarian cancer patient we do braca testing and always suggest them because we have seen patients of braca mutation who developed ovarian cancer after few years of time so that is very important so red flags for cancer susceptibility multiple family members age uh, of onset of breast cancer bilateral breast cancer both breast and ovarian and ashkenazi jewish ancestry and male breast cancer this should always be screened for braca mutation and it is very important as a gynecologist uh, no need to send the patient to medical oncologist or anyone you can yourself do there are two types germline and somatic sometimes there is always a confusion between the residents what is germline and somatic germline which gets inherited from the family you can do it on the blood but if you want to do a somatic you have to do on the tissue from the uh, cancer site so lifetime risk you can see for the braca 1 it is 35 to 60% 30 to 50% braca 2 and mismatch repair gene that is for mainly for the endometrial and also for the ovarian so braca 1 is mainly related to breast ovarian and if male breast cancer patient or prostate cancer so there is a braca 2 mutation so figo staging you can see here why it is important why the histopathology is important because all based on your staging your survival depends including your histopathology if you have invasive epithelial malignancy your uh, the five year survival rate is slightly less then you are stromal and germ cell tumors so that's the reason staging is very important which is in ovarian cancer so in gross for the residents stage 1 limited to one or both ovaries stage involves both ovaries confined to pelvis that is stage 2 tumor spreads outside the pelvis to the peritoneal cavity or lymph nodes that is the stage 3 and distant metastasis is stage 4 see many times we see patients who have mild effusion ovarian cancer patients with mild effusion on the chest x ray you should always tap why because if i go back here you can see pleural effusion with positive cytology automatically patient goes in stage 4 that is the reason if we have a breast cancer patient with minimal or moderate effusion you should always tap and see if the cytology of that patient histopathology it is very important and crucial in ovarian malignancies that is the reason all the pathologists always ask for a good tissue you can see here the various histopathology originating from various areas like uh, high grade serous carcinoma low grade carcinoma clear cell which is a very uh, uh, bad prognosticating uh, carcinoma endometrioid carcinoma and mucinous carcinoma among this clear cell and mucinous they have a bad prognosis and we always need histopathology detail histopathology to understand see you can see here pfs and ols that is a, a progression free survival and overall survival are lower in mucinous or clear cell histology than serous or endometrioid ovarian cancer that's the reason histopathology is very important 
So I am directly going to the initial management. Uh, once the patient comes to you, I know most of the patients comes to you only. So patient presenting with ovarian cancer related symptoms, you have to go through the history, see history, physical examination. If, if you feel something is there, you can suspect, if you are suspecting ovarian cancer, you have to do the workup, including sonography, CA-125. If, if you feel there is abnormality, you can do imaging, CT, abdomen and chest. There is always a confusion whether to use PET or not. See, what, what we have learned in our practice, if you do CT, pelvis, abdomen, chest, it involves a cost. Test PET CT is a single scan which gives you detail about each and everything. If I talk about breast cancer, in stage 3 breast cancer, if you do a PET scan, you upgrade to stage 4 in 30% of the patient. That's the reason if affordability is not the issue and you have the source for a PET scan, you should always do a PET scan to understand bone metastasis, lung metastasis, all those things. If you have any abnormal or suspicion for ovarian cancer, you have to send to the gynec team or gynec oncology team and see whether surgery is feasible, what is the state and treat. If you find any other thing, you just go to the risk assessment and see if the patient is have a risk of uh, ovarian cancer and based on this risk, you have to decide whether the patient is a high risk to go for genetic testing and based on genetic testing, you have to decide. So this is the important uh, flow chart. Similarly, these are the guidelines. I think uh, NCCN guidelines are difficult for everyone to understand, but I am just giving you a brief. The flow chart starts from this to this. Clinical presentation, you see all this, any symptoms which you know better than me. Then workup, which includes scans and CA-125. There are some other markers also, inibine and all those things, but they have not given a clear-cut idea to us. Right now still, CA-125 is one of the good marker to tell us. And then you have to clinically stage the patient. And as per the stage, you have to decide. The most important point for today's lecture is this one. So stage 1A to 4 patients, surgical candidate, optimal cytoreduction like. If the patient can, if the surgeons can do optimal cytoreduction, then even if it is a stage 4, you can consider for uh, optimal cytoreduction. But if the patient is a, a poor surgical candidate and the surgeon feels no optimal cytoreduction is difficult, then you should go for new adjuvant chemotherapy and then followed by surgery. So the role of us comes here. We come here also but after surgery and here we come before the surgeons. So I will not talk too much about surgical because I am not the surgeon but the, what the guideline says, if the patient is a newly diagnosed invasive ovarian cancer confined to ovary or to the pelvis. So you have to, the, this is a uh, procedure which you have to go through, you have to do the peritoneal sampling, peritoneal cytology. The important point here is you have to do parotid lymph node dissection should be performed by striping the nodal tissue from the inferior vena cava and aorta bilaterally to the level of inferior mesenteric artery and preferably to the level of renal vessels. So why this is important? If the patient is having a stage 3 or 4 disease, there is, I, I'm, I will be going to show you the trial. Uh, you don't need to uh, dissect the lymph nodes if radiologically the lymph nodes are not there. If you feel that radiologically lymph nodes are not there, clinically if you feel lymph nodes are not there, there is no need to dissect the lymph nodes in stage 3 and 4. But in early stage, which patient comes to you most of the time, so you, we need that lymph node. We see many times the histopathology report which shows TAH, BSO and omentectomy, but we don't see lymph node in early stage. So we need to see the lymph nodes in early stage. If you open the abdomen and if you feel there are lymph nodes in stage 3 and 4, you should do lymph node dissection. But if you don't find on the table and the allergy is not showing any lymphadenopathy involvement in stage 3 and 4, you can avoid lymph node dissection. Still, still the surgeons do say lymph node, uh, but what the guideline says. So, uh, if you see a patient involving the pelvis and upper abdomen, so primary cytoduction to achieve maximal cytoduction at all abdominal, pelvic and retroperitoneal disease. Residual disease less than 1 cm defined optimal cytoduction. However, maximum effort should be made 
to remove all gross disease since this offers superior survival outcome. This is the line which is important for you because the previous guideline used to say less than 1 centimeter, but now it says optimal site reduction involves remove all residual disease, whatever you see, remove it. There should not be any micrometastasis, microvisible disease should not be there. So, primary treatment of most ovarian cancers involves surgery, which is followed by chemotherapy, which I already told. There was a discussion with uh, in the previous one talk about uh, laparoscopy and uh, whether to do laparoscopy or not if you have a stage 3 and 4 patients. So, to understand what is the extent of disease. There is a recent randomized control trial which has shown that the 10% of the patient in diagnostic laparoscopy had futile laparotomy versus 39% of the patients in the primary cytoreductive surgery. So, if you feel a, a bulky disease, you can do laparoscopy and avoid futile laparotomy. And if you feel there is not a bulky disease, you can consider for primary cytoreduction. So, cytoreduction goal, why it is important? Because if we have a maximal cytoreduction, the survival improves. So, you can see the kaplan meyer curve here. So, now the talk is lymphadenopathy in dissected. So, this is many times we discuss in our tumor board. Same thing I told you, ki whether to go for lymph node dissection or not. So, you can see this is the lion study. They have taken adult patients with suspected or proven FIGO stage 2B to 4 ovarian cancer, macroscopic, complete resection and clinically, radiologically and parotic lymph nodes whether to do go for lymphadenectomy, just like what we do in CA endometrium. Even if you do surgery for endometrium, we always try to target the lymph nodes. In ovarian also, that dilemma came whether to target the lymph nodes or not. So, here we don't do, you can see here in patients with advanced ovarian cancer, intra-abdominal complete resection and clinically, radiologically negative lymph nodes. So, the median OS is 67.2 months, 5 year overall survival is 56 percent and progression free survival is 26 months. So, did not improve OS or PFS despite removal of subclinical metastasis in 56 percent of the patients and it has increased post-operative morbidity and mortality. So, investigators concluded that systematic lymphadenectomy is not recommended in this population of patients. So, now goes to the treatment, adjuvant treatment of ovarian cancer. So, you can see here, just to grossly remember as a gynecologist or the resident, stage 1A, stage 1B, grade 1 endometrial carcinoma. Other than this, everyone needs chemotherapy. So, stage 1A, stage 1B, grade 1 endometrial carcinoma, excluding this, all other patients needs chemotherapy, including high-grade serous carcinoma, including other malignancies like mucinous, clear cell, clear cell automatically, even if histopathology is showing clear cell, you have to give chemotherapy. So, you can see here, except stage 1A, 1B, grade 1 endometrioid, all other patients need. But if, if you have a stage 1A, 1B or 1C, we give 3 cycles of chemotherapy. But otherwise, in all other patients, we give six cycles of standard paclitaxel and carboplatin. You can see here, this is the flow chart. I think after finishing, you will be slightly understanding the NCCN flow chart. So, that is a very important for us. So, what are the platinum based chemotherapy regimens? So, there are different trials. I know most of the people say medical oncologists talk too much about trials. So, I have not put any trials so that all of you should not blame me. So, I have kept everything very simple for understanding. So, if we can see here, the platinum based uh, chemotherapy is recommended and the dose is 175 milligram per meter square over 3 hours through the codon IV set along with carboplatin AUC5 or 6 uh, over 1 to 2 hours every 21 days. We have a dose dense regimen which we give to the elderly population who have com poor com we have a comorbidities where we give weekly Pacli and Carbo to them uh, which involves 75 to 80 milligram of Paclitaxel 
and uh, carboplatin AUC2. So these are the different regimens. So now comes here, patient comes to you and you, you have seen the patient and histopathology or uh, laparoscopy has decided that uh, feasibility of surgery is not possible or you have a histopathological confirmation by biopsy. Ideally in stage 3 and 4, don't do biopsy from the ovary. You should do the biopsy from the omentum or any other areas because we have cases where we initially on the CT field, it's a ovarian malignant, it's a omental deposit, peritoneal, but once the surgery is done, it came out to be negative. But being the patient's ovary was ruptured, you have, you have upgraded the stage. So automatically you have to be careful when you have omental or any other deposits, you should do the biopsy from that and not to do primary from the ovary if you feel radiologically it is a dicey situation. So here we have confirmed and my surgical team has told me it's a poor surgical candidate or low likely of optimal side reduction. I am very favorite among my surgeons because I always send all my patients to surgeons first. I always send them, I take their tick mark, see you tell me surgery possible or not. So automatically they tell us, no sir, surgery not possible Mukesh, you take the chemotherapy. There is no blame on my side so that so surgeons say, no, no, surgery may kar sakta tha, kar sakti thi, lekin aapne beja nahi hai. So always tell surgeons to come first in a picture, let them see. If they say surgery is feasible, I am okay with it. My question is always to them, whether you are doing optimal side reduction or not. If you are not... Uh, okay with it, please don't do. I will go for chemotherapy. You can do the surgery later. So, poor surgical candidate, new adjuvant therapy. And genetic risk, including germline and somatic. Right now, to somatic we are not doing. No. There are panels which do, but in our hospital still we are doing germline because we have a coupons. We can get it free of cost germline testing. And among, if I test, among 100 patients, I get 5-6 patients who are BRCA positive. So that is uh, very important. I think in all ovarian cancers and breast cancers, you should do BRCA testing irrespective of your uh, stage. So here, I am giving chemotherapy to the patient. I am seeing the response. Then I hand over to surgeon again for interval site reduction. And clinically, after every cycle, we check whether the ascites has gone down clinically, how much is patient better. So most of the time we give three or four cycles of new adjuvant chemotherapy and then hand over to the surgeon. So if we have a response, then we ask for interval site reduction and then followed by the adjuvanting two cycles. As I told, six cycles of chemotherapy are given in ovarian cancer. Sometimes if two bulky disease was there, we try to push for eight cycles. But ideal guideline, six cycles of chemotherapy. If we have a stable disease, till we uh, want surgeons to uh, take the decision. If they say possible, it's okay. Otherwise, we continue two more cycle and again ask the surgeons. If there is a progression, progressive disease, it's very unfortunate. But always I say if the disease is progressive, you have a histopathological diagnosis of high-grade serous or ovarian cancer and you are progressing on platinum and carboplatin, you have to bang your head first and understand something else is cooking because Pakli Carbo works very well in serous ovarian cancer. So always you need to check, rethink yourself, your diagnosis is right or wrong or you are missing something or there may be some genetic alterations which is not uh, because of which you are not, patient is not responding to the chemotherapy. So that is very important and you should not be just progressive disease a medical oncologist ke baad bhej don't know, not like that. You have to scratch your head first. Why the patient is progressing, there must be something else. But all patients, they respond, initially they respond very well to chemotherapy in ovarian cancer. So, this is for you, current indications of new adjuvant chemotherapy in ovarian cancer. So, a poor performance, medical condition or optimal site reduction less likely. The second is CT finding with diaphragmatic disease more than 2 cm, extra peritoneal disease, multiple liver meds which you cannot resect, uh, involvement of protohepatis, pancreatic head and body of pancreas and suprarenal parotid lymphadenopathy. These are some of the indications where we feel uh, new adjuvant therapy should be given first followed by surgery. 
So, neoadjuvant therapy is an option in selected patient, which I told. These are the trials, but I, I just put the names of the trials, which has told us there is no much of survival benefit between neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus primary site reduction. But you can see the, the surgical comorbidities and the post-op recovery will be less if you have given neoadjuvant uh, therapy followed by surgery. Otherwise, survival-wise, there is no difference. So, guidelines, as I told just now, suspected, does the patient have perioperative morbidity? Yes, chemotherapy or no cytoreduction and go for uh, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, some drug reactions to platinum, I am not going to discuss too much because time limit will be there. So, platinum's most common during infusion, there is high possibility of infusion related reaction. You can see if it is a mild reaction, you can just give a wheel hydrocot and you can again re-challenge. If it is a serious reaction and life threatening, you have to stop the paclitaxel and use other regimens which includes liporopal, doxorubicin, gems, gemcitabine, which are the other regimens which you can use. So, this is most important when you give uh, paclitaxel because it is very common to have allergic reactions. So, that is the reason you always have to pre-medicate the patients with dexamethasone, avil and hydrocortisone all together. So, frontline treatment for stage 3 and 4, similar to the previous uh, slide. Previous slide, you can see surgical candidate, poor surgical candidate and then decide as per. Now comes here, see we are always greedy. As a medical oncologist, we feel, or as a, as a doctor, we always feel, yaar cha chhe cycle de diye abhi, lekin abhi patient baad mein kya karna hai? Patient to progress ho jayega stage 4 hai to. So we are always greedy, what to do next, what to do next. So we have other options like other chemotherapies, targeted therapies, hormonal therapies, we can, which we can give as a maintenance therapy to the patients. So it is always like that. If you have a paclitaxel platin, you want something else. Then you have a pacli carbo, you want something to add. Then you have a pacli carbo and targeted therapy. So this is now talk of the time and you have to have this and you should upgrade yourself. It is not like that. So, uh, 20 years before I used to use paclitaxel platin, I am using that. No, no, no. You have to upgrade yourself and you have to understand there are things which are changing, practical modality treatments are changing, everything is changing. So you have to have your mindset and change yourself, change mindset and you should treat accordingly. So now the same thing, if you have ovarian cancer, if you have done surgery, treatment, everything. So maintenance therapy, we have seen many patients which we have kept on maintenance therapy and they went into cure. But we don't use the word cure for them. But we have seen they have cured. So that is the reason maintenance therapy is important because if you keep the patient on observation, we know that uh, the patient can come back with a relapse recurrence. So that is the reason maintenance therapy is important. So maintenance therapy start started with initially Paclo, Paclitaxel, but uh, because of side effect profile, it went off. Then Bevacizumab came in a picture. Bevacizumab is a monoclonal antibody which acts again vascular endothelial growth factors because what all, everyone needs uh, food just like us tumor needs blood. So for the blood to suppress that tumor, we have this drug which reduces the feeding, blood feeding to the tumor and uh, because of this, then the tumor shrinks and uh, we have a good progression of the disease. After that, the uh, talk of the uh, down, I can say, or talk of the oncology field, is a PAP inhibitor olaparib. You can see here, I think pointer is not working. So, so you can see olaparib started. It's a PAP inhibitor and after that newer generation olaparib has been started and along with, now there is a last year data of using olaparib plus bevacizumab as a maintenance therapy in uh, uh, stage 3, stage 4 ovarian cancer uh, with BRCA mutation positive and they have a good survival. I have a, just out of this talk, I have a breast cancer lady who had a breast cancer in 2018, one of my known relative with brain metastasis. And uh, then they asked me the survival, I told probably triple negative, six or eight months probably. Then uh, being she was young, 40 years, I checked her BRCA mutation 
and she came BRCA positive. And I started without any chemotherapy to that lady. I started on Olaparib. She took two years of Olaparib. And uh, since 2021, her PET scan is in complete response. And she is absolutely fine. And now 2022 ending. And they asked me the question, sir. Uh, they are my relative. They asked me, you said TNBC is 6-8 months brain meds. And I told see these are all the genetic markers and uh, you should always do this and uh, right now you cannot um, if you see her you will not uh, feel that she is a treated case of triple negative brain ca breast ca brain metastasis so that's the reason molecular evaluation is very important that's the reason previously i was telling if you have a patient of ovarian cancer who is progressing on paclicarbo that means something is fishy something is missing or you have less knowledge, you are not able to understand what is happening. We also, sometimes we ask our colleague or our teachers who has taught us, sir, as I say, ho hai, progress, ho hai, pata nahi kya ho hai. So you always search the literature, you always search something that uh, something is missing. And all oncology patients, I always tell in my each meeting to each and everyone, so don't deprive cancer patients by treatment. Always I see many times uh, stage 4 hai, inoperable hai, advanced age hai, advanced comorbidities hai, nahi nahi kuch nahi dena hai, rehne dena. You, you, because we have seen the surprises. We treat them, we see the surprises, the patient responds very well, they have a good quality of life and they respond. So you should always give a first chance to treat them by whatever modality, but you should always give them the chance. So bevacizumab, as I told, these are the trials, I am not going into the details of the trials. And bevacizumab is uh, continuing as a maintenance therapy if you have added from the start. So PARP inhibitors, these are the drugs which I was talking. And this is the flow chart which has been started. What are PARP inhibitors? See what happens when the tumor cell breaks down and uh, automatically the cell cycle repair. If the patient is having BRCA mutation, then the cell cycle repair will not happen and they turn into the abnormal cells. So here we try to uh, block this uh, uh, BRCA mutation by the PARP inhibitor so that the cell killing will happen and the uh, tumor suppresses. So why BRCA? If you can see here, 50% of the high grade serous ovarian cancers of alterations in uh, homologous recombination repair genes. So these are the uh, various uh, genes most of the time we check BRCA1 and 2, PALB, CDK2 and these are the markers, biomarkers which we check and depending upon on this we tell. Now there is a talk about using HRR gene panel, HRD gene panel. So these are basically the further progress of uh, BRCA mutation. So previously we used to do germline BRCA1 and 2. As the research has gone, we have found that the HRR gene panel. So the HRR gene panel means that is a cause uh, for the change in mutation and cause of ovarian cancer. After that, now we check the HRD gene panel which checks the genomic instability, loss of heterozygity, telomerase, everything. It's not only about BRCA mutation, it's about more than BRCA because as I told, progressive disease, BRCA is negative but still they have HRR gene mutations or HRD panel deficiency and these patients also benefit from PARP inhibitors. So that's the reason if cost constant is there, you can at least do BRCA. If cost is not the issue, you can do HRD panel and you can check. So what are the evolutionary milestone in frontline maintenance? Bevacizumab, now these three drugs are there. Niraparib, Olaparib, Rukaparib, Veliparib, these are the drugs which are used. Now there is a, this is the proposed flow chart. Again, why I am giving every time this flow chart? Because the different guideline has given this flow chart. It's not my guideline, these are the different guidelines. You can see here, check the mutations and based on mutation you have to decide, give chemotherapy. If you have used Bevacizumab as a uh, initial regimen, then you have to continue bevacizumab along with the PARP inhibitors and if you check any mutations, treat accordingly. The lower down are the different trials which I am not going into the details. So, so genetic testing in ovarian cancer, what are the current guidelines? So in epithelial ovarian cancer, if you have a high grade ovarian cancer, the germline testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2 
and other ovarian cancer susceptibility genes. It is recommended for all women at diagnosis regardless of family history of ovarian or breast cancer. If not perform a initial diagnosis, testing should be offered as soon as possible. Somatic testing on the tissue recommended from women without germline mutations. At disease recurrence, offer somatic tumor testing and consider mismatch repair gene testing. In clear cell mucinous or endometrioid, you have to use somatic testing for the recurrent disease. Because there is no clear data of using maintenance therapy in clear cell mucinous or endometrioid. For endometrioid, we have a hormonal therapy which we use. So this is very important slide. I think for us it is more important but so you can see here if you have a stage 2 to 4 breast ca uh, ovarian cancer you have treated and if you have not used bevacizumab you can check the BRCA mutation. If the BRCA mutation is negative but you have a complete response still there is a drug called Niraparib which is approved this year to use as a maintenance therapy. But it is a costly drug as I told these are very costly drugs and we everyone blames medical oncologists for these costly drugs. They say medical oncologists always give some costly drugs and this cost is always more but we see responses that's the reason we use this drug and these are research molecules. These are not the routine drugs. These are research molecules and we have seen responses that's the reason we use this. Then you have germline mutation automatically you have to use olaparib, niraparib uh, as a treatment option. If you have used bevacizumab as a treatment option during initial treatment, then you have to see here if the patient is having, uh, uh, patient is not having BRCA mutation, you can just continue with bevacizumab. You can see there is a column here, as I told, BRCA mutation, HR proficient. That means if the patient is HR deficient, still you can use PARP inhibitors. So here also you have to use PARP inhibitors if the uh, HR deficiency is there or if the mutation is positive automatically the patient should take uh, PARP inhibitors. The current treatment options for ovarian cancer you can see this is a number of list of drugs. It is much more than this but I don't want to dilute you with so many drugs. Immunotherapy for MSI or DMR, uh, DMMR positive patients. So that's the reason in clear cell and other areas we check this uh, MMR gene panel. So these are the various drugs uh, which we use in different uh, types of ovarian cancer. That's the reason why I always ask for immunohistochemistry because your treatment decision is based on your histopathology. And histopathology report should be very crystal clear saying whether it's a high grade serous, endometrioid, clear cell, carcinosarcoma, whatever it is. So these are the various drugs for different uh, histopathological uh, treatment. So follow-up recommendation, I think this uh, most of you know, physical examination two to, two, two to four months for two years, CA-125, which many people ask whether CA-125 is required to test or not. But if the patient has previously high CA-125 before you started treatment, then you should always uh, do CA-125 assay. That is a good marker to tell us and that is a cheap marker to tell us. You cannot be every time doing CTs and uh, uh, PET and all those things. Just by CA-125 you will have a gross idea whether something is happening or not. If the previous CA-125 was high. Because if, because if you have a mucinous, uh, all those areas, their C125 will not be too high. So depending upon the baseline value. So now this is important because this is a, this year's ASCO guidelines. This was the questions asked by the gynecologist to the oncologist. The first question was what clinical evaluation should be performed in all women with suspected or newly diagnosed stage 3C or 4? So the recommendation says should be evaluated by a gynecological oncologist prior to initiation of therapy whether they are candidate for primary cytoprotective surgery. So these are the recommendations. Uh, if you see the 1.2 recommendation, CT of the abdomen and pelvis with oral and intravenous contrast and set chest imaging for the extent of the disease. So you can use other modalities like PET scan if you have a disability. So this is the first question. I purposefully kept because this will be the questions for you. The second question, what, which patients and disease factors should be utilized as criteria and identify patient for uh, not suitable for PCS? This already I discussed, who have pre-operative 
or risk factors or achieving site reduction is not possible should be given new adjuvant chemotherapy. The third question, how does new adjuvant chemotherapy and primary site reduction surgery compare with respect to progression-free overall survival and perioperative morbidity? So the, for, for the, the answer is, the for women who are fit for PCS with potential resectable disease, either new adjuvant or PCS may be offered based on data from the phase 3 RCTs which I told you RTC that demonstrate a new adjuvant chemotherapy is non-inferior to PCS with respect to progression-free survival and overall survival. And the new adjuvant chemotherapy is associated with less peri and post-operative morbidity and mortality, shorter hospitalization, but PCS may offer a superior survival in selected patients. So, similarly, Question 4. What additional clinical evaluation should be performed in all women with suspected before new adjuvant is delivered? So all patients should be histological confirmation, core biopsy preferred if possible, invasive ovarian, fallopian tube and peritoneal. In exceptional cases, when a biopsy cannot be performed, cytological evaluation combined with CA125 to CEA ratio is acceptable to confirm the primary diagnosis and exclude cancers that are not ovarian, fallopian tube or primary peritoneal cancer. So if you don't have a biopsy, if you don't want, you can just confirm by cytology and if the CA125 is high, if your imaging says probably it's a primary ovary, then you can consider new adjuvant chemotherapy there. No need of biopsy. The question 5 is what is the preferred chemotherapy regimen which I showed you for new adjuvant, platinum and taxane doublets is recommended, alternate regimen based on the patient factors. Question 6. Among women treated with new adjuvant chemotherapy, does the timing of interval adduction or the number of chemotherapy cycles after interval adduction affect the safety or efficacy? RCT is tested surgery following three or four cycles of women in, uh, who has a response to new adjuvant chemotherapy or stable disease. Interval cytotherapy should, should be performed after less than or four cycles of new adjuvant chemotherapy with response to chemotherapy. Alternate timing of surgery has not been prospectively evaluated, may be considered based on patient disease. But after four cycles, you have to consider for uh, surgery. So what are the treatment options with uh, for patients with progressive disease, new adjuvant therapy? You have a poor prognosis, which I already told. Options include alternate chemotherapy, clinical trials, discontinuation of active cancer therapy, end of life. There is a little role of surgery and it is typically not advised unless you have a palliation. So the last summary. So uh, I am telling multiple times. So early stage surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy based on histopathology. Stage 2 to 4 surgery excluding patients for new adjuvant chemotherapy as per criteria and excluding stage 1A and 1B Grade 1 endometrioid adjuvant chemotherapy with paclitaxel and carboplatin for 6 cycles. No loss of lymphadenopathy in advanced disease if nodes are not involved radiologically. See, don't take my words other way. In early stage, you have to do a lymph node dissection. Otherwise, will be Dr. Bangas told there is no need of lymphadenectomy. In advanced disease, if the nodes are negative, clinically, radiologically, you can skip. Stage 3 and 4, maintenance therapy with bevacizumab and part inhibitor. This is a costly treatment. Uh, but uh, this has to be given and this is important. Biomarkers including BRCA, MSI should be checked in all patients with ovarian cancer if cost is not the constraint. So this is the, the one of my last slide. I work for a large multinational company. We are looking for a world class experts in digital. See I am your man but I am not cheap. Because Olapare, Bevacizumab, all these drugs are costly drugs and definitely if you really feel the patient can afford for these therapies, you should check for mutations otherwise don't confuse the patient. Because if they cannot afford, there is no point in uh, explaining too much about it. So, thank you. The